Um, this ongoing series is sponsored by the Bronfman Brenner Center for Translational Research, which is focused on using research to solve human problems. Um, we like to think that we help Cornell social and behavioral science researchers to study challenges across the lifespan by linking scientific evidence with practice, outreach, and education. Um, the center is directly sponsored by the sponsored by the College of Human Ecology, and we have our, our dean here today. But we like to think of ourselves as being a, a university-wide resource, resource that hopefully folks are starting to draw on more and more. Um, just so that you have a sense of what other things are coming down the line in terms of the talks at 12, we'd like to encourage you to take a, a flyer on your way out. Um, and the other thing that you should find on your way out the door is there, there should be information on the how to conduct translational research series that we're offering. Um, this is something that we've rolled out for the first time this year and which is either done or almost done. We have one more on the 24th, I think on focus. But we, um, Janet and Carl and I have decided that we will officially be running it again next year. So certainly if you have thoughts on that or just would like to participate, it would be great to get a flyer just to have a sense. Um, and then the final thing I want to say is that we hope you'll take a, a little bit more time to learn about the, uh, the center if you're looking at the website. Um, and, and which you can do by just entering Bronfman Brenner Center into a search engine. So, but just sort of scope around, we've been trying to really improve sort of our web presence. So with that being said, I'm going to give our dean a long and embarrassing um, introduction before he introduces Dana, which consists of, this is Alan Matthews, our dean. <laughs> Thanks, Chris. Um, it's really, really my pleasure to introduce Dana um, to you. and I just. Um, so Dana has her um, bachelor's in science degree from human development, and then I think it was called family studies back then. Mm -hmm. We nixed the family. Who cares about family? Just human development. Um, and when we were chatting, we um, um, she was guided very much by Bill Trocham, who's um, still an active part of the college and, and works very closely with our medical colleagues at Wild Cornell Medicine. Um, so we were talking about Bill, so. but when I first ran into Dana after um, many years since she graduated, uh, Cornell was um, uh, sort of a sad event, but a memorial event for um, Cornellians who um, who died during 9/11. And Dana's brother um, Joshua um, was one of those people. So there was a memorial service at Annabel Taylor Hall, and there's actually a um, uh, uh, memorial plaque there, and so we got to know each other during that event. She was there, I was there, and we started, I said what she's doing, and she started describing what she does at the Chapin Center, Chapin Chapin Center, and um, I'm like, oh my God, you are what we preach. <laughs> um, and so the way I think about the Bronfer Burner Center from its inception, so when John Eckenrod and Carl Pillimer um, and I started discussing the Family Life Development Center and the Bronson Brandon Center before. We, we sort of used, in some sense, what Bill's working on in New York, where they have a translational science center. And there, the goal in the medical community for years has been, how do you go from the bench, the science, to put that into clinical practice on the bedside? And there's, everybody believes that's so the right thing to do for medical schools, but it's just equally important in the social sciences that we go from the research lab to actually influencing practice. And that practice can be the way we interact with communities, the way we interact um, with families, and train families to, to do things, but also at the very highest level, how we influence um, the policy world. And so um, Dana is a great example of trying to use evidence-based work to influence the way policies um, get developed and get implemented. Um, after Cornell, she was at, she received her PhD at, from Northwestern University, um, and now she is a policy fellow at the at the um, Chapin Hall Center for Children at the University of Chicago, which is an accredited institution um, like Cornell. Um, she provides analytical, analytic consultation and policy guidance to child welfare jurisdictions across the country, and she teaches data for policy analysis and management to master's students at the University of Chicago the School of Social Service Administration. 
and our research is focused on quantifying resource accessibility, analyzing the role of geospatial relationships in child welfare systems, and then evaluating the implementation of evidence-based models in child welfare and juvenile justice context. Um, it's really been a total delight to re-engage um, and to know that the training that you had here at Cornell is still living with you and um, that you've been influenced by, by what you've experienced here at the Plays Out. I would really feel to your which you have to say. So without further ado, Dana. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm always happy to come back to Cornell. Usually it's for personal reasons, but to be here for an intellectual reason is <laughs> even more exciting. Um, so I'm going to talk about data-driven policy making and just start by talking a little bit about what is data-driven policy. To me, that means using available information on needs, outcomes, and change over time to inform a whole variety of decisions. The development of new programs and the continuation of existing programs, choices among different strategies we might use to address problems, or the distribution of resources among communities. And I'm going to show you examples of all of these. Okay, so let's say, I thought of this yesterday because I was getting on a plane. Let's say when I got on my flight to Detroit, because I have to fly through Detroit to get here from Chicago, let's say that the pilot said, you know, I'm not going to talk to the tower today. I'm not going to check the weather. I'm not really interested in what the radar says about where the other planes are. I know how to get to Detroit. I'm just going to go with my gut. I know how to get there. That would be absurd and very scary. Yet, that's a lot of what we hear twice last week. I heard a child welfare director or someone in a leadership role say, I don't really need to look at those data. I know where the problems are. And we encounter that a considerable amount. So in the absence of data, how do these policy decisions get made? They get made based on all kinds of things. They get made based on people's values and philosophies and child welfare. The pendulum swings on how people feel about keeping kids with their families versus removing kids at sometimes to very far away places. Um, people make decisions based on the relationships they have with other people in the field, maybe existing contracts. People oftentimes decide to maintain the status quo and to keep things as they are. And people often react to sensational stories. In child welfare, we have a lot of that usually when there's a child fatality. New York City experienced a, a few of them over the summer, and there were some quick policy reactions to that that we've um, actually been involved with trying to um, slow down and reformulate. Um, so data-driven decision-making is challenging because it requires policymakers to do a few things that can be kind of uncomfortable. One is to challenge popular notions. So when there are these big bad stories, there's public outcry, and everybody kind of extrapolates that this is the biggest problem we have facing us, and oftentimes systems direct resources to those things without considering the overall trend, the frequency of the event, or the things you would need to do to prevent it. So one requires us to challenge popular notions. Sometimes it requires us to change course if we observe that the data are telling us that what we're doing isn't working. And it also requires the long view. So it requires that we invest in the data infrastructure and systems that collect data that are reliable so that we can use it to inform our decisions. So what I'm going to do in the little bit of time that we have together today is I'll tell you a little bit about my background and just a little bit of child welfare background so that you all have a foundation for understanding. Then we'll talk about what I think are the strategies for effectively transferring knowledge to these systems that we're trying to help. I'll give you some examples of empirical inquiries that have been used to inform policy, and then we'll just touch on what are some of the hazards, although you could probably already think of some, um, of making policy without data. So um, as you already heard, I provide analytic consultation across the country, and what that usually, use, what that usually involves is helping systems to use their data to improve the rigor with which they select interventions or implement those interventions. And these are just three of the kinds of questions that we try to help places answer. Who are, who are we serving and what do they need? Where should we concentrate our efforts in the system? And how can we tell if what we're doing is working? Now, for those of you, how many of you are familiar with child welfare? Most of you, so I'll just kind of cruise through this. Um, 
the, each year, states investigate roughly 3 million reports of child maltreatment, and of these, just under 700,000 are substantiated. And when those reports are substantiated, uh, approximately a third of them are removed from their homes and placed in some kind of substitute care setting. Um, this is just, I'm kind of just building this map of the system for those of you who are not familiar to it. So then kids spend a period of time in substitute care, or they may, and then they exit to permanency, which could be they were reunified with their families, or they're adopted, or they age out of the system, which is an outcome we try to avoid, but for many kids that is a reality. And then those cases are closed, and some systems provide for post-permanency support. Um, in some forward-thinking places, there are also aftercare services that are under the umbrella of the child welfare system. And even more important, as we talked about in the podcast this morning, sometimes also in the front end, there are prevention services. Um, and the outcomes that the child welfare system tends to focus on are safety, permanency, and well-being. Now, those are largely defined by federal standards, but there are lots of different, way, different things that we look at that fall into these three areas. Also, sometimes these three things are artificially separated, like a system can say, we, we don't have the money for all this other stuff, we're focusing on safety. Well, you can't really accomplish one of these things in the absence of the other. So I just wanted to put all of this out there for you. I won't read through all of it because I'm eager to get to some examples, but this is what we are working towards. Okay, so when I thought about what could I communicate to you about what I think is unique about the way we're doing this work and, and what really makes it effective, what makes research usable for these systems, I came up with a few things. So number one, what I, the research that we're doing is different from traditional academic research in that the priorities are defined by the systems we're working for. So there are lots of things I'm interested in, but I pursue the research questions that these systems need to answer in order to solve their problems. So the, the questions are coming from the systems I'm working with. Um, second, we really try to help people think and articulate, think about and articulate what it is they're doing and why they're doing it. And we're going to talk in a few minutes about theories of change. Um, the third thing is that we really try to be responsible in our use of administrative data, and that is kind of a complicated thing. We were t I was talking with Min about it at breakfast this morning, that, you know, as researchers, we, we get administrative data and we're super excited to have these big data sets. We try to work collaboratively with these systems so that we really make sure that we are making meaning of the findings in the way that is consistent with the way the data are collected and what it means to the system. And so to do that, we view the research process as collaborative with the system stakeholders and iterative, meaning we don't go do the analysis and then deliver it to the system. We do a first run, we come back and we say, here's what we're finding. This is kind of counterintuitive and sometimes a system says to us, oh, you know what? That allegation field, everybody just puts this number three code. And we need to know that because we need to go back then and take that out of our models or find a more reliable field. But you wouldn't know unless you were engaged in this iterative and collaborative approach. Um, we also do something that we call strategic implementation support. So oftentimes we go into a place, um, some of it is in the context of the Title IV-E waivers where state child welfare jurisdictions are implementing and demonstrating the effectiveness of an innovative strategy. And we come in to help them and they say, oh, Jennifer's the, per the waiver person, that's who you need to work with. Now, not, nothing can be accomplished with one person, but a lot of times when we approach these systems, that's kind of how it's set up. So some of what we have to do is help them build the governance structures, figure out what teams do they need. Do they need to have regional representation? What do they do to really make sure that, what can they do to make sure that the implementation um, is solid? And then we provide a lot of data analysis, and I'm going to talk about examples of these. Um, some of it is very basic descriptive statistics that, even though it's basic, can be very illuminating. Um, I'll talk a little bit about the geospatial analyses that we do, um, and then we do some other things, latent class analysis and predictive analytics. Um, this is just a visual, and I won't go through all of it, to show you this alignment I was mentioning between the research priorities and the policy priorities. So the way I look at this, You've got decisions to be made at the level of an individual family or youth, at the level of a program, and at the level of the whole system. And then you've got these different functions. You've got decision support, you've got outcomes monitoring, and you've got 
quality improvement. And we do things, each of these are like a kind of analysis that we do for a place. I'm going to talk about this one and this one and this one. Um, but when I think of, I tend to think in matrices, and this is one of them that kind of captures how our work falls out. Okay. So I mentioned that we help people articulate, or we ask people to articulate their theories of change. And people have surprisingly little patience for this exercise. We all have theories of change. I mean, you're eating a sandwich because you're hungry and you think if you're hungry when you're listening to this talk, maybe you won't be able to pay attention. So you have like the expectation of a short-term outcome that you won't be hungry and the expectation of a longer-term outcome that you'll get something out of the talk. We have theories of change all the time, but when you actually ask people to slow down and tell you, why are you doing this? Why are you training these foster parents to do this particular thing? They get really frustrated because they take for granted that everybody knows. Everybody, and I've been on the other side of that table, so I've been the recipient of federal funding that has asked me to do a whole template spelling out my theory of change, and my reaction is, well, duh, of course trauma is important. Everybody knows that. But what this theory of change exercise allows us to do as evaluators is it allows us to measure more than just was the big outcome we were after accomplished. It lets us look, and this is something Bill Trosham taught me, it lets us look at the mechanisms along the way to try to understand where things fell apart if they didn't work. So theories of change ask us to define the problem and identify the population at risk for having the problem that we're going to intervene with. It asks us to spell out what are our strategies for addressing the problem and what are the levers, how, is, how are those things going to achieve change. And then it asks us to spell out what our proximal and distal outcomes are. So basically we ask people to speak in this language. We observe that, we think it's because, so we plan to, which will result in. And it results in something that sometimes can look kind of complicated, but it gives us a lot of different things to measure. So this is actually a theory of change for the, the federally funded study I was just referencing where we were training foster parents to be more trauma aware. And ultimately, we're interested in improving permanence, but as you can see, even if we don't get there, we're interested in knowing whether we were able to improve affect regulation, decrease symptoms, improve placement stability in order to get to permanence. So as, an, as a researcher partnering with these agencies, it's really important, this is a really important tool that we use. Um, and often the theory of change is, is, um, is in the context of a larger logic model, which I'm going to skip over in the interest of time. Okay, so another thing we talked about this morning on the podcast is that I tend to think about this, I tend to think that we're using a developmental approach to this analytic consultation. And what that means to me is we're meeting systems where they're at. So some places we go to and they have very sophisticated questions and they have decades worth of data to use. And so we have the luxury of doing some really complicated, interesting things. Some systems we go to and they just want to know where do they stand relative to other states in the rest of the country. Or they don't really have that much data, so all we can do is basic, um, basic trend analyses. So we, we, we try to answer the kinds of questions that are feasible and that are um, relevant for the system. So it, goes, uh, it, it increases in complexity from how are we doing to where should we concentrate our efforts to what does this population need to who is at greatest risk, and that's where we're doing the predictive analytics that I'll talk to you about. So this is just kind of starting, I'm going to show you examples of all of these. So this is, this is pretty basic. This is from a state that we're working with who is uh, doing a Title 40 waiver, and they just wanted to know, they wanted to understand whether their numbers were going in the right direction. And just to explain what this is, the, the red um, refers to the the left-hand y-axis is the number of kids in care. And you can see it's been kind of, there's been some volatility over the waiver period, but it's kind of up a little bit. And we help these places also to see that the entries and exits to substitute care relate to this overall caseload line. So whenever the entry line, which is the lighter line, goes above the darker line, which is the exit line, meaning they're taking more kids in than they are discharging, the red line goes up, and that's like basic math, makes sense. But this is a picture of the whole state, and it would suggest, well, we're doing okay, we've been up and down, but we're just a few up. 
But when you break it down geographically for them, it gives them a much clearer message of what they need to do because these counties on the right that are in gold, these 10 counties saw their combined caseloads increase by 23%. And these counties over here are doing great. And so a strategy that would be based on this really wouldn't be a, an efficient or an effective strategy. And a lot, you may be looking at this and think, well, of course. But it's not an of course to some of these systems if they don't have a researcher who can partner with them to look at the data, not in the context of a big study, but a conversation about, well, what's your strategy going to be? And we actually did, took this a little further. We consulted with some financial trend analysts to see if we could identify discrete categories of trends in the data. So there are actually three groups of counties in this state, a, a group of counties that are, kind of oh, that are kind of steadily decreasing, a group that dips down and then are coming back up, and a group that's been relatively stable. Um, anyway, so this is to the question of, well, where do we stand relative to everybody else? And this is an example for Illinois. So the bar in red is Illinois, and Illinois takes fewer kids into foster care these days. There was a tremendous reduction in the late 90s, and now we take fewer kids than almost any place else. 1.6 per thousand we take into care. But when you look at how many kids are actually in substitute care in Illinois, we're right at the average, 5.4, right in the middle of the pack. And that's kind of puzzling. If we take fewer kids than everybody else, why do we have right around the average number of kids? It's because we keep them longer than anybody else. So because of the relationship, because of the length of stay is so long, at any given time, we have more kids in care because those few kids we took have stayed longer. So again, this is another example of just helping people understand how these dynamics relate to each other because it begins to point them in the direction of what they should do. Now, in Illinois, like in some other states, we have a big metropolitan area around Chicago, and the rest of our state is largely rural. And, the, and, and it's big. And the downstate lawmakers tend to think about child welfare as an urban problem. They think it's a Chicago thing. And at one point, it was a much more urban problem. But those reductions that happened in the late 90s largely happened as a result of reducing the number of kids we took into care in urban environments. So what we've had to help these downstate legislators understand when they think about their budgets and don't really think child welfare should be on their radar screen is that Chicago has seen a 52% reduction in the number of kids coming into care, but downstate has seen a 14% increase. So the, the, the geographic trend in child welfare has really changed in Illinois, and we illustrate a picture's worth a thousand words, so we also always try to provide maps when we can. And this is a picture of that percent change. The blue areas are area counties where there was a reduction in the kids in care, and the red areas are the, area, are the counties where there's been an increase. Uh, and actually, the darkest red on this, you can't read the legend, is more than 100% increase. So this was really important to show those downstate legislators. And this is, this is uh, the percentage increase. This is actually the intake per thousand. So th there are a couple different ways we display things on the map. Here you're looking for that, those areas of green concentration, but either way you look at it, child welfare is becoming more of a downstate problem that we need to make relevant for those, um, for those legislators, but also the providers in those communities. And we use maps to do a lot of other things too. I mentioned gap analysis. This is a picture of where we have capacity to deliver evidence-based trauma treatment. And the blue uh, shading is where we have um, children with trauma, needing trauma treatment per square mile. So you could see how useful this would be if you needed to build capacity. You might want to contract with a provider in Peoria because you've got a hot spot there or with one in Champaign. Now, this is children per square mile, so it's controlled for the population. This is just, oh wait, no. This is per square mile, not controlled for the population. This is controlling for the, per 1,000 people. Either way, it helps us to understand kind of where are our hot spots and how should, where should we um, plan resources. Okay, so shifting gears a little bit, and I know I'm taking you on like a, supersonic trip through all this stuff, but I, I have time. I'm happy to talk about this, and I, I told the dean I'm happy to come back and talk about it more. I love talking about this. Um, okay, so my colleague Fred Wilson and I were hired by the state of Arizona, the, the legislature in Arizona, in response to an egregious oversight that left 6,000 
hotline calls not responded to, meaning 6,000 cases went uninvestigated. Um, the Arizona legislature in 2014 hired us to come in and do an independent review of their system to figure out what happened here. And there's, that is a very long story, and the review actually you can read it on the uh, Office of the Auditor General's website in Arizona, but there's just a couple of graphics from it. Um, but anyway, so what we're trying to understand in Arizona is why were these numbers going up? Why were admissions outpacing discharges, and why was the caseload growing at such a fast rate, particularly after 2009? Well, so our first thought was, well, let's try to understand this abuse, neglect, or is there like an explosion of child abuse in Arizona during this time? Well, in fact, not at all. So Arizona, the rate of physical abuse of kids in Arizona is the yellow line, and it is coming down during this period, just like the gray line, which is for the whole United States. So nothing strange about that. But the rate of child neglect, which is the orange line, there's something really strange about that. That skyrockets after 2009. Mm -hmm. So that is a clue for us as super sleuths that we try to be to try to figure out, well, what, what was going on there? So we learned two things. One was a data answer, and one was a larger policy context answer. The data answer was that there was a slight change to the way that substance-exposed infants were being coded as an allegation, so that in 2009 they began to code substance-exposed infants as a neglect count instead of abuse. That was number one. But more related to the context, the other thing that happened in Arizona, seemingly unrelated in a different part of the state, was that the legislature voted to discontinue child, welfare, child care subsidies for poor families, except in cases where the child was, became a ward of the state. So you can imagine both the, I mean, you can imagine what the unintended consequences of that were, but many of the reasons that kids come into care for neglect are poor hygiene, inadequate clothing, no supervision in the home, no food in the home. Many of those things are secondary to poverty. And indeed, what we found was not only this precipitous drop in the child care subsidies, but that the rate of children living in poverty in Arizona was going up during this same time. But it took partnership, I think, with a researcher to be able to see this, because if you're just sitting there in Arizona looking at it, the first solution they came up with was, well, we got to fix our hotline. Well, that wasn't, I mean, they fixed the hotline, they just started getting more calls. So. Anyway, this was part, now I'm happy to say Arizona is actually doing much better a year and a half later. We just went back and did a follow-up, and they're doing some amazing things um, using data to prompt forward motion in their system. Okay, so I mentioned latent class analysis, and this, this is another technique that we use when someone comes to us and says, well, we have this population we need to do something about, but it, we kind of think it's not just one population. So. Uh, in the case of latent class analysis, we're trying to understand the heterogeneity in a group that we think isn't just one big group, but we can't tell what the latent subgroups are. So we identify a set of dimensions and we use statistical software to come up with an optimal model, meaning how many, group, how many subgroups are really in this group. And then we, once we have our solution, we try to describe those groups in ways that will help us plan interventions. So we just did this in Texas where we, we got some data on a group that was supposedly a high-risk group that they wanted to try to see if a lot of the work I'm going to talk about is about reducing reliance on congregate care, not putting kids in big residential treatment settings. So they had this group of kids, high-risk kids, and these are the eight dimensions that we decided to cluster on or look at how they co-vary. And what we came up, what we realized was, well, this isn't one group of high-risk kids. This is actually four groups. There's a group a very small group that has abusive caregivers who are ending up in residential care. There's a group that has absent caregivers, caregivers who have either died or been incarcerated, and those kids are ending up in residential care. And then there's these two groups that have, I think, direct service implications. One is families that have relinquished custody of a high-need child, so a child with severe medical needs or mental health needs where they are relinquishing custody so that the child welfare system will pay for needed treatment. That suggests the policy fix. And then we've got this other group that is limited caregiver capacity and high rate of caregiver substance abuse, which also has implications for intervention. But you can see how this, when you get a, a sample of, I think there are 934 kids in this relatively small sample, you don't know what to do with it when all you know is they're high risk, but when you start to look for the latent differences in these groups, then it suggests some 
um, policy recommendation. Okay, so I mentioned that a lot of my work has been focused on decreasing the use of congregate care. I actually brought with me a couple of copies of the uh, brief we released last year that I wrote for Chapin Hall. This is a collaboration between the Chadwick Center that oversees the California Clearinghouse of Evidence-Based Practice, many of you are probably familiar with. We collaborated with the Chadwick Center. We used NSCA data, Child Welfare Administrative data, and then information from the Clearinghouse to try to write a policy-friendly document that would guide legislative change and other changes uh, um, to encourage moving away from congregate care. So I encourage you to look at it. I can send you a link to it, too. But anyway, I'm going to get specific about this because Along these lines, we've been engaged in this effort in Illinois, um, using predictive, ultimately using predictive analytics. So Illinois is interested in um, reducing the length of time and care. As I showed you, we're like the worst in the country. We keep kids for so long. And one of the predictors of spending a long time in care is being placed in a residential facility. So this is all part of this larger effort. We have loads of data in Illinois and a lot of robust research partnerships with that system. So we had almost 36,000 cases to work with, and our first thing was to try to untangle, well, how are kids ending up in residential? Like, we have to try to understand this problem. About 17% of cases experienced congregate care during their first child welfare spell, and of those, three quarters of them were experiencing it as their first placement. So right away, that signaled to us, okay, that sounds like a different dynamic than just a child has severe mental health treatment needs and they're eventually getting to a residential. I mean, oftentimes we think kids fail up to residential, they don't do well in a foster home, they go to a more intensive foster home situation and ultimately they get to residential treatment. Um, of those 75 cases that go straight in, meaning the first we get this kid and we put them in residentials, most of them were coming from another institutional setting. So realizing that we had two groups to try to understand, that suggests two different sets of solutions. So for the direct entry group, we really wanted to understand what are those institutional pathways? Are we getting judges who are taking kids out of juvenile justice and just saying, well, this kid's not going to go to jail, but they're going to go to a residential facility because that feels comfortable? Or do we have a capacity problem where we just don't have foster homes for certain types of kids? That was the, those were the solutions for the first group. But then we have this later entry group, those 25% of kids that are eventually getting to residential care. And what we wanted to know about these was, are there things, characteristics that we could perceive when we first meet this kid that might signal to us that we need to do something more intensive so that they never end up in residential care? And so that's what we did. We ran some predictive models using, I think in this case, Cox regression, and we um, identified the predictors of ultimately being placed in residential care. And these are, the, these are some of them in bold. Older age at case opening, um, being male, being African American, being from Cook County, and we have some clinical characteristics as well. So I'm summing up like two years worth of stuff in very, like five minutes, but, but what we ended up doing, we ended up doing three things for the Illinois Department of Children and Family Services with this. This all resulted in writing an RFP, a request for proposals. The department said, okay, Based on what you did, we want to request proposals from providers to develop an alternative to residential care informed by this. So we helped them with that RFP in that we used the predictors to be eligibility criteria for this new program. And we literally translated the predictors to be eligibility criteria. We used the analysis that we did to identify where they needed capacity geographically. So we said it's actually in these three regions that you have these kids that are ultimately going to residential care. And then we also helped them in the body of the RFP to identify these are the services based on what we know about these kids coming in. If you're going to place these kids early on in this therapeutic foster care setting, we have to be addressing trauma, we have to be addressing these other um, issues. This is like, like a kind of soup to nuts example of how you, we did a research inquiry that actually informed a, a policy action. Okay, so I thought I would kind of, I know I talk really fast, so I got through all of this very quickly, but um, I thought I would talk a little bit about, so what are the hazards of operating without a flight plan? What happens when we decide we're not going to talk to the tower or look at the weather or radar or anything else? 
and I, I think there's five of them. So number, there's probably more, but um, number one is when we're myopic, our focus on the present problem obscures our view of future problems. So when we get all mobilized to address the thing that's right in front of us and we're not looking at the trends either to see what proportion of the bigger problem is made up of this one thing or to see how things are likely to go down the road, we um, kind of shoot ourselves in the foot because we're not thinking about solving those longer term problems. When we're reactive, we focus on outliers instead of the trends that might tell us which solutions will have the broadest impact. And this happens all the time. We get phone calls saying, we have to do something about the hospitalization of young children. We're hospitalizing like four-year-olds and we have to stop doing that. Well, we're not hospitalizing any, first of all, we're not hospitalizing very many of them, not that any of them should be hospitalized. And second of all, the rate has been stable over the last like 20 years. So, but somebody read a story, got really upset about it, and would like to divert a whole bunch of resources to that. And so it's a, you know, it can be challenging to have these conversations and say, well, how do we incorporate our ideas about prevention and try to, to use our resources most efficiently? When we don't consult the evidence and consider the context and examine the data, we might choose the wrong solution to the problem. I actually have loads of examples of that throughout history, but um, we, We'll only go into them if you're interested later. Um, okay, when we're not methodical and intentional about how we implement things, we sometimes have unintended consequences. We can have the best plan. Did anybody over the summer read that? I think it was over the summer, maybe it was last year, read that story about the Mulligan Road Project in Arkansas? This is not related to child welfare, but this was in the New York Times. This was, an, this was a project that was supposed to be like a prisoner reentry job training program. It was actually based on a model that was tested in Cook County that was successful. But in the Cook County model, they had about three years, they were teaching these people to do home demolition. And they did about 150 homes in three years. This Mulligan Road project, they were trying to solve also a problem of urban blight, and they were going to demolish 300 homes in like a very short period of time. And in order to do that, even though their plan was sound and everything they proposed to do was good, in the implementation of it, they realized, we're not going to have enough time to do this. Let's apply to the EPA for an exemption to the asbestos abatement rules. So they ended up getting, miraculously, getting this, uh, getting this waiver. And then you can read it, you can look up this story. It's crazy. And then, so the first 30 guys that get trained to do demolition have no protection no training in how to handle asbestos, and none of the other environmental safeguards that they are required to do when they're doing asbestos abatement. That, to me, was a perfect example of a botched, I mean, really badly botched implementation where if you looked at it on paper, it looked fine, but somebody sitting at their desk was like, I have an idea, and the whole thing ended up having unintended consequences that really, you know, outweighed any positive gain. Um, and when we don't measure the short and long-term outcomes, we don't know soon enough that what we're doing isn't working. So that's really the importance of that theory of change and thinking through what are we, how will we know if we're at least on the right track? So what, are we, what needs to be in place? So I, I talk to a lot of people about this stuff and this, many of them think, well, could I, could I engage in this? What, do I have, have the right pieces in my system? So I tried to give some thought to what, what, would, what do you need there to be? Um, Number one, so the elements of our flight plan are ongoing monitoring of data to detect trends and changes. So being able to keep your eye on how things are going. Um, looking at aggregate indicators rather than individual cases. Using empirical inquiry to answer specific policy questions that are relevant for the system. And theories of change that guide both the implementation and the evaluation. And that, that also requires fidelity measurements. I mean, if someone had been doing a fidelity study of that Mulligan Road project, there would have been like alarms going off when they got to, okay, did you do this part of what you said you were going to do? Um, but this also requires a few other things. And this is the part that kind of can trip systems up. You have to have administrative leadership that actually cares what the data say. And I mean, I'm, I can be very persuasive, but when, so I've, for a period of about seven years, I worked within the Illinois child welfare system. So I was what you would call an embedded researcher. 
I was a policy advisor to the director. I seemed like I was a regular person on the leadership team, but I was thinking always with a researcher's brain about, do we have data to answer this question, and how, where can I find it so that we're not just sitting around a conference table coming up with our, our best idea. Um, so during that time, for most of that time, I was working under the person who brought me there, Erwin McEwen. But when he left, and usually when the leader leaves, everybody they brought in leaves, but I stuck around, and I stuck around through six other rapidly transitioning child welfare directors. Some of them were not at all interested. I mean, I still have my office, and I still have my hands in the data, and I could walk the data down the hall and say, this is what the data are saying we should do. We shouldn't shut these family advocacy centers down, or we shouldn't. But if the administrative leadership is not interested in what the data, I mean, we kind of have this problem on a grand scale. <laughs> if the administrative leadership is not interested in empirical guidance, it's really hard to make this work. Um, the other thing that I think helps is contractual agreements that support the research partnerships. Like, you know, we have a contract with the Illinois Department of Children and Family Services that allows, and data sharing agreements that allow us to um, use their data in ways that help them. Um, but that also supports the infrastructure and the ongoing um, technical assistance that are required to maintain the data. And then the last thing, and this is what I started with, is I think it requires alignment between the research and practice priorities. There, I'm a naturally curious person. There are lots of things I would like to study, but if I don't have a person who's struggling with the issue, I'm, I don't, I mean, from my perspective, I don't really have a reason to go try to answer the question. Um, anyway, so that, I think, is the end of my prepared comments, but I would welcome questions or conversation about any of that. Two questions. So one, I, I noticed we have programs on grandparents becoming primary caregivers. Mm -hmm. I didn't see the flow of children into, did I miss that? You mean in the child welfare system? Yeah. In the picture? And it's, it's a large number. We're yeah, those would be relative parents. placements. Oh, relative placements. Yeah, that's what we call them, but... Uh, yeah, kinship care. Oh, okay. kinship care. That's what we call it. Yeah. I, I um, but but you said grandparents. You know that um, the states states have had very different approaches to engaging family, and some states have like Illinois went through a massive effort to license the relative foster yeah. parents. I don't know if they're licensed here, which allows them to get paid yeah, and allows yeah. them to so receive states training. Very yeah. States very dramatically. So. I've spent some time recently in a couple of southern states where. Because that was my follow-up question: was, Do you does the formality of those things matter in terms of? I think it does, and actually made a recommendation to one of these southern states that maybe you should consider whether an effort to license relative foster parents would help, because in some places the culture is such that the biases against biological family. I mean, they just have this mentality that. The apple doesn't fall far from the tree, and if this happened with this kid, I'm, I don't want to deal with anyone in the family. And really, it's, it's, most of these kids, when they get older, they end up reconnecting to their family. The second broad, broad question is, one of the things, what I like about what the work you're doing is the goal is not for publication, it's for policy. And there's this growing unease in broad social science research that there's this problem of publication bias. Mm -hmm. The only way you publish something is if there are statistical significant findings. And so does the research literature you read make things look like it will more things will work than what you tend to find without having this a no result is an important mm. result rather than it going into the ether of publication. Yeah. So it's kind of a dual question. I mean, the question about can you trust the research literature, I think, is connected to whether we think that randomized controlled trials really should be the gold standard for human service interventions. Because I think a lot of the, I mean, we've set that as the bar, but a lot of those studies are not generalizable to the larger system because the complexities just weren't there in the study and you couldn't, you couldn't replicate them the study, so there's that. Um, I also think the time lag, you know, a lot of the work that we do, if we don't deliver an answer relatively soon, it's just not relevant, so there's kind of like a quicker feedback loop. I will say we sometimes write 
papers or present at conferences about how to collaborate on these things. So like I presented with m one of my colleagues in New York City who's inside that ACS system on how we're doing predictive analytics. Like how do you do it responsibly and what kinds of things should you take into account? Which is not to say, you know, I, there, are a lot, there are a lot of pieces to it. Yes. Uh, yeah, I, I come from a big history in data warehousing mm -hmm. uh, in the business side, so I, uh, <laughs> and this looks like exactly the problem I've struggled with for 12 years uh, doing marketing research. And the question I have is that uh, often when we went into a business, we would find the data in smokestacks and different systems. Mm -hmm. And I'm assuming you find the same kind of situation. Yeah. How do you get together? How do you get? How do you assume, uh, accumulate the data so that you can actually do analytics on it across systems? Yeah. So there's been some good work done by some of my colleagues at Chapin Hall. Um, one of one of them is Bob Gerga, who did something called the multi-problem family study. The the bulk of the work was in linking the data. The actual analysis, he was trying to understand what proportion of families, you know, that study. We're doing linking. Oh, you are. Okay. It was more just like a side. A side. <laughs> <laughs> well, I can put yourself as Bob, but but anyway. Um, you, you know, yeah. okay. Anyway, so Bob was trying to understand what proportion of families that we see in child welfare actually also had a contact with DHS and with homelessness and with. It. So he was trying to, but but when you hear him talk about that study, what he talks about is the linking. I mean, the methodology after that is counting. It's not that sophisticated. So I, I would just emphasize with you. I mean, I think the other struggle that we have is with these data sharing agreements because depending on the leadership of those systems. Some of those systems recognize, the, like DCFF, the child welfare system in Illinois recognizes the tremendous value of having a research partner at the table. The system in Illinois that oversees Medicaid, which is a different agency, has a, is much less um, amenable to research inquiry, in part because I think they, they haven't, they don't see where they, their system has benefited from it. So there's a lot of relationship building and awareness promoting to get systems to understand why they should share. It doesn't solve the linking problem, though. I don't know how to make that. I mean, only, I have been at the table for probably 15 years in Illinois for conversations where they've talked about all building one big data system. I still think it's like, sure, yeah. Other thoughts? Yeah. So I'm, I'm not in the field of child welfare system, but I'm a PhD student focused on uh, nutrition mm -hmm. welfare programming, and I really am interested in doing work in my career that parallels your your system where your research questions are coming from the community, they're coming from people who are making policy decisions, and yet as someone who's trying to establish themselves in a research academic track, and you're getting messages about how to do that and what kinds of studies to do and how often to publish, I feel like the two sometimes the two tracks are a bit contradictory yes. and wondered if you had any advice to share for those of us earlier in our career. This is being about. recorded. <laughs> <laughs> mean, I mean, we talked about this this morning. You know, I've often at points in my career had people tell me that the right way to do it is to get another postdoc or post, I mean, I don't know. I, I've always been driven by the desire to have an impact and have been less concerned with like, I, I mean, I've had a very atypical path. I'm trained as a clinical psychologist, and I use those therapeutic skills all the time with these systems, but I, I, you know, I definitely didn't, like when I decided to do the policy work, I, I can't say that I followed like the prescribed path for that either. I, so I, I, and I think it goes back to your question as well, like are we going to, as a field, place the priority on this academic, like turning out articles that we're not sure ha are actually generalizable to the field, or are we going to at least shift some of our time and effort to developing researchers who can do this kind of work so that we can solve some problems? I will say the center is really designed to bring those worlds together in many ways. That we want evidence based, we want the work to be publishable, and publishable, and we want the social purposes for the work itself. I'm convinced of what I'm seeing in NIH, what I'm seeing in some of the funnies, they almost demand now the application more and more. Uh, so, I mean, I think NSF is more less connected with ultimate impact and the certain goal to that. But this is really, this is really And there is a reality. 
reality to the fact that the, the publications and the credentials, get, I mean, you have credit, I wouldn't be standing here if I did, you know? So you, you do need credibility to be able to get into these spaces that people will trust you to do this work. So there's, you know, there's not an easy answer about how to balance it. I mean, you look for any opportunity to kind of leverage one to help move the other forward. Yeah. I think for leading to that point, one thing I found interesting in your example of your work in Arizona is that it wasn't just that you were drawing questions from what the policy makers or stakeholders in the agencies were doing were asking for, but you also helped shape the questions being asked by looking at the data. Mm -hmm. And so I, I don't know, do you see that as a way that like maybe the academic researcher has actually helped in that you're you're trained in a way where you're in some disciplines to ask mm -hmm. questions that aren't necessarily immediately prompted by someone on the ground. And yeah. That's kind of Space may allow for more creative. That sleuthing of aspect of, yeah. it, of trying, really trying to figure out. Well, also, the people who are inside that system have a view of what they can see, but from outside of that system, our vantage point, you know, was much bigger. So we could kind of scan the environment for other things that were going on. Um, you know, I also think on the flip side, there are some places that are so enthusiastic about data and do. I've had two people in the last couple of months, say, we want to do predictive analytics. Well, what do you want to predict? Well, you know, bad stuff. <laughs> like, well, well what you, you know, there, there are people who are really excited and they want to be on board with the data thing, but they can't formulate a research question. So that's often where the conversation starts. It, it then goes to the theory of change, but you, you have to kind of pin people down to, to make sure it's worth doing, you know, to make sure there's actually a question there. Yeah. yeah, just kind of curious based on what you said and what Steve said about um, the current political context. I mean, are you are you just hunkering down and bracing for the next few years and hoping all of the storms to be a weather storm <coughs> with the, the anti-science, anti-evidence context? Or are you expecting to be there to be sort of down the line policy changes or funding changes that will affect Chase Center or some of the other agencies you work with? I mean, I, I mean, to some degree, there already have been some. I think that Dean and I have the same approach. We stop watching the news and we're just working really hard. <laughs> um, but, you know, I worry about that. I mean, the, I don't know how many of you are following the Families First legislation was, it, that didn't pass, that we thought was going to pass, that was going to allow, was going to shift funds from congregate care to the prevention end of the continuum. And, and that was really disappointing, and I can't, I can't blame that on our, on the, administration necessarily, but the climate that, I mean, I think, I think what we're learning more and more is that there's, um, you know, we sit in this room and I imagine many of us are like-minded, but I think something that this election shown a, shined a light on was that there are many, many people that don't think the way that we're thinking about these things. And if we only talk to the people, this is a whole other conversation. I mean, I'm fascinated by how social media directs our attention to the things it thinks we will like, and in doing so, it builds this illusion for us that every, the world is as we think it is. And, and it's, I think it's really, I mean, clearly it's really dangerous. We need to be talking to each other. Um, I have had opportunities, like I said, I've spent some time in a couple of southern states recently where I've confronted this head on. I mean, some people who actually were like proudly taking credit for defeating that awful family first legislation. And I, you know, so there, there's a lot of work to be done. But I'm not, um, I mean, I'm not discouraged. There are always going to be kids and that are going to, you know, and we're going to have to respond to child abuse and neglect, and there will be families that need help. So I'm going to just keep trying to come up with good answers to those systems. Other questions? You know, I, I, yeah. I, I have something that I hope will turn into a question. Uh, <laughs> but I haven't been able to formulate it in my brain totally. But the, the thing that I really enjoyed about your presentation was the, the different examples of the, uh, the way that you highlight variability mm -hmm. uh, you know, in terms of the geographic maps and also mm -hmm. the, the sort of sorted yeah. bar charts. And, um, uh, and then also, too, with the latent class analysis. Mm -hmm. even, even and, uh, and that triggered for me that um, uh, the this, this sort of idea of policy implications in terms of, um, you know, a lot of times we, and I'm wondering if you have some examples of maybe where this might have come up in your own work, you know, where we, we develop a solution um, and then we go straight to scale mm -hmm. and we implement large, mm -hmm. uh, you know, like Burger King, go large, mm -hmm. and then and then it, it falls apart. And so I was 
curious in the work that you've done, have there been examples of where you've, you've been more iterative yeah. and picked sort of targeted implementations that then sort of evolve over time? Yeah, and, there, and I think that's happening increasingly. The project I mentioned, <coughs> the federally funded project, tests the psychoeducational trauma training for foster parents. We actually had to go through a period of usability testing, which was first just to make sure that the thing we were doing was a thing, you know, that you could distinguish it from not that thing, so you know who got it. Um, and then we did formative evaluation, which was to make sure that all the beginning indicators were going in the right direction. And then we moved into summative evaluation. Now, while we were in that process, it felt like it was taking forever. But in hindsight, I, I think that was a useful strategy. And that's based on implementation science. Many of you are familiar with that, the idea of this phased approach to evaluation. Um, which I think we tried to do more of. It, it's so interesting. I mean, we, we have these child welfare systems that often lack the resources to do the things they need to or want to do. And then we also interact with nonprofits, like some deeply funded foundations that are doing what you're describing, where they're like, we saw this program. We want to put it everywhere. And they actually do have tremendous resources, but you then think, well, I, isn't it kind of my responsibility to keep you from you know, going too fast and putting this everywhere when we don't even really know if it will be effective. Anyway. Maybe one final question? I think we got along. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for coming. My pleasure. Thank you.